Hello, everyone. Welcome to Palladium Magazine's Digital Salon with Laura Deming. I'm Wolf Tyvey, Editor-in-Chief of Palladium. I'm joined by Ash Milton, our Managing Editor. Hey, everyone. Laura Deming is the founder of the Longevity Fund, a venture capital firm that focuses on life extension. She was homeschooled in New Zealand, taught herself mathematics, literature, and history, and was working in a biological research lab on aging research by age 12. She was accepted to MIT at age 14, but later dropped out for the Teal Fellowship. So Laura, welcome to the salon. Thank you, cool to be here. Great, so as usual, we're joined by our live audience of Palladium members. This conversation will be recorded and released on YouTube and as a podcast. To become a Palladium member and get invited to upcoming salons, please visit palladiummag.com slash subscribe. We'll be answering live audience questions in the second half. Please be sure to use the Q&A box in Zoom down below to up and upvote other people's questions. So I'll start with my first question. So Laura, you've had a pretty unique educational experience, like I mentioned in your bio. What are the greatest advantages you got from that experience and what do you wish you'd done differently? Uh, I mean, I, I think, so I had a really weird childhood. Like uh, I, I grew up in right. New Zealand. Um, I basically stayed in our house all the time. So that's why I still have an American accent, not a New Zealand accent um, for that kind of odd reason. And um, my, my dad like is in love with science. He cannot stop talking about it. So as a kid, I was just indoctrinated with this idea that science is the greatest good that kind of, you know, scientists are kind of the heroes of our time. Um, I knew like, you know, Michael Faraday's story actually about going and um, sort of getting Humphrey Davy to take him, his aunt, him on as his, his, his assistant. And that's how I sort of knew to go and like, you know, email scientists, ask them to take me on as their, um, kind of, sort of uh, workers. And so, yeah, I mean, basically it's just like a lot of science indoctrination really early, which is great because um, I still like science and that turned out to be a, a good thing. Yep. Um, I think probably the downside would have been um, less lab experimentation. So like I tried to build a lab in my basement and it didn't really work out so well. There was no like, you know, online course as to how to do this. And so um, I think like proximity to a physical lab earlier would have been great. Um, but that, that's probably the biggest downside. Hmm. So when you talked about uh, your experience being homeschooled, one of the things you kind of mentioned is that, you know, the experience like you obsessively study cool stuff that you're interested in, um, instead of being kind of conditioned by the idea of a real world that you had to adapt to. I'm interested, was there ever a point when the idea of a real world was something that became necessary for you to sort of accommodate? Or like, did you come away thinking that actually this is just a mental trap that forces you onto a normalcy track and stops you doing interesting things? Yeah, definitely. I think the first kind of example was um, trying to work in a lab. And then there's like a lot of bureaucracy that, especially if you're 14, you're trying to work in a lab. Like it's, if you're under 14, you're actually not allowed to. Um, so there's like a lot of bureaucracy involved in kind of, you know, making this, right. this happen. And, um, I remember it was just kind of confusing why this wasn't allowed, like what, you know, should or shouldn't be the rules and regulations in place. It's actually still a, a kind of travesty. Like there's a lot of teenagers right now who can't work in labs, even the professors would love them to, um, because there are a lot of liability issues that universities have with regards to having young people in a lab environment, which I, I mean, if I were a university professor, like I, I would understand that, but like, it's just sad that like professors who want to take on like minors can't um, mm -hmm. because of these kind of like uh, sort of uh, it, it, university level rules. Who's um, behind, that's a university level thing. I was going to ask yeah, who's behind far, those restrictions. As far as I understand, if you're a volunteer, it's not like a federal law. I, I think it's just like a liability issue for the university. And so they kind of right. have a blanket rule against having people under a certain age, like in a lab environment, mm -hmm. um, which, which makes sense in some cases. Like if you're in a certain kind of lab, like a very, very um, simple organism, a BSL-1 kind of you know lab, it, I, I think there, there should be exceptions for, for maybe um, young people who are like very excited and curious. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you said that um, when you first were wanting to work in a lab, like you had this plan of going and offering to like clean floors and stuff and, and, and work your way up. Um, and, and eventually I think you just got an internship. Uh, is that right? So like what, what for you, uh, if you're giving advice to people, is like the way you kind of managed to get your way in at a very young age? Yeah, so there's there's this really really cool story. So I, I, I think like people don't like read the history of science enough because there's just so incredibly many cool anecdotes. And there's this one awesome anecdote about Michael Faraday, who was this young bookbinder, and he loved to read the books that he was binding, and he was really passionate about um, all of this uh, sort of knowledge. Where he he went to watch the World Society lectures of this famous chemist Humphrey Davy, and um, he ended the lectures by 
binding a book together of Humphrey Davies like full red lectures you know in the same way that kind of Blake Masters did with Peter Thiel for zero to one mm, right, right. um that's actually later than kind of Michael Fairley doing this for Humphrey Davy. um and uh, basically Humphrey Davy was like okay this is interesting you can come with me as my valet and that was the beginning of kind of um, Michael Faraday's introduction to um, science in this in this way. And I think stories like that are, are, are pretty inspirational. And, and I always kind of like, I, I guess like that's what motivated me to have this passion to like do work. Like I was like, give me the most menial labor and I will do it so I can justify mm. being in the lab. And I think I was really lucky in that Cynthia Kenyon, um, who was a professor who allowed me to work with her, is probably one of the most incredible people I've ever met. She actually had mentored multiple young people in the past um, to, to kind of you know, amazing careers. And she just said, no, come work in the lab as though you are a normal student. Um, she mentored me on, on science, like on a regular basis. So it, I, I was very lucky. Like I met a professor who like genuinely would take like a 12 year old seriously, which is almost unheard of. But I think um, for most kids, like the idea of being willing to do anything to get into a lab is actually probably a good prior. Um, mm. so you're a fan of the apprenticeship model, I would assume. <laughs> I, I like the kind of like stoic philosophy that would lead you to want to like do that. Mm -hmm. Do you have apprentices Great. now? Uh, apprentices um there's actually so this is a hilarious uh, under documented fact there is a hilarious number of um very excited teenagers actually quite a few girls um right now who want to work in longevity like i get multiple emails um on a monthly basis from like 12 year olds 14 year olds 15 year olds who are already in labs or already doing research um kind of already doing really interesting stuff so it, it's it's definitely a kind of growing uh, phenomenon hmm. well, well, uh, well that I leads yeah. I, well, this leads to a, a question I had, which is uh, for people who are in school right now or they have kids in school, how should we be approaching education? Uh, we've talked at Palladium to a lot of students who are taking the year off, doing some cool research or, or whatever else, thanks to COVID. Um, when is it appropriate to drop out or do homeschooling or try these other unorthodox educational paths? I, yeah, I, I, I wish I was like a better thinker on education. I, it's weird because like, I, I don't really know. I just naturally like like to learn. So I, it's very hard right. to model what it'd be like not to have that. Um, but I, I think like one thing that's been interesting to kind of watch a lot of these kids is that they, they're not getting the right education in school for what they will need to learn to like work in the industry. So like, that, that, that's pretty clear. Like I think um, if you're 14 and you really want to work in longevity, there's a pretty specific set of like facts and models that you should try to upload as quickly as possible. Like you should try to understand drug development, you should try to understand basic biology quantitatively, you should try to understand kind of how the industry works overall. And um, even to find college courses on a lot of that stuff is very difficult. Um, and so I'm not right. actually sure, like, like for me personally, when I was in college, I didn't have really any way to practically learn what I needed to understand about this industry. I had to go work in it to understand it. Um, I think there should be a way to directly educate people more because that's just like, like a, a lot of this is not implicit practical knowledge. It's literally like facts or models that you can just like make explicit. Um, but I think it's basically like nobody in the industry is incentivized to go and make these models explicit because they like, can make more money and make more drugs in a short term like basis mm -hmm. by sort of uh, just operating on their own. And, and there are some good courses like Vicky Sato, I think at um, Harvard might have some good courses in development, but I think they're not super available to the public. And like Peter Kolchinsky's book on like biotechnology future is still one of the best resources that we have available, which is just, it, it's really weird to me um, and to a lot of other people in the industry like that, that but then we're not writing the material, you know, so. Right, so this is some combination then of, of basically apprenticeship and liberating information is kind of what people need to be doing. Yeah, it, like, it, it, like somehow find a way to get that information out of those closed circles and, and into sort of a more digestible form for, for it, people who might be curious in the public. Exactly. But, but my point is that like a, a lot of the time people view that like the need to go apprentice is, is, is because like there's all this information that's implicit and it's hard to like externalize and learn. And my point is that like actually right. for my industry is a lot of information that is very easy to externalize and like make explicit. And, it just and hasn't been. It's not something that anybody who's a true expert would want to do, and the true experts are professors or people who work in the industry, often on different aspects of this, and so they're right. not incentivized to teach um, as, as much, um, or at least as publicly as much. And so there's some like content, but it, it, it's quite sparse. And so if I were 14, I was trying to learn this industry, I still don't know exactly what I do, and it'd have to be like a lot of from first principles, um, not to overuse the, the term thinking. Um, mm. Well, I once heard this really um, take on the the idea of like a curriculum that by the time something is put into a curriculum, it is already obsolete because you're essentially taking things that have worked in the past or have worked up until the present moment and you're putting it into this digestible form. Right, that's um, not how industry is thinking right now. Right, right. Well, think of how apprenticeship uh, traditionally works, right? You don't actually learn a bunch of theory first. 
and th and then you know you start getting to do stuff you actually start doing stuff first and then as you go through the process of it you start understanding why you're doing that stuff uh I'm, I'm sure you must have had some experiences like that in the lab, uh, Laura. So I, yeah, I, I kind of oppose these two uh, ways of learning in my head. So, um, so I, yeah. oh, go on. Oh, go ahead. I, I'm just going to kind of obnoxiously argue that I actually have the opposite view, which is that like, for example, Newton's laws will never be like um, out of date. They'll be updated and I'll have sort of additional layers added to them. But like the, the true good models that you should try to learn as quickly as possible are exactly those ones that shouldn't go out of date in your curriculum. It should be kind of like the, the mm -hmm. core forever. And it's just mm -hmm. like the case that it, it's hard to figure out, like it, it's hard to figure out what those are and that even there are models like this for things like drug development um, where there seems to be like a lot of, like, like, like there's a, a general feeling about my industry is that there's like a lot of confusing stuff going on. It's all rather stochastic. There's no clear deterministic path to like success. And there's, I mean, there's, there's no like clear deterministic path to like absolute success, but like there's a lot of very useful physical models of the world that you can build that like will inform your thinking that like aren't externalized. So I, I, and it won't go out of date anytime soon because they're like yeah. physically true. Mm. Um, yeah, well, this is, this is my impression of like pre-industry education. Uh, you know, my, you go to school, you learn a bunch of these first principles, you learn the basics, you learn the well-established techniques that are the basis for understanding how to kind of grow your knowledge base in some other direction, then you go work in industry and necessarily there's a whole bunch of specific knowledge you have to learn there. When I did fuel cell development, it was like this. We didn't learn anything about that in school, but we learned chemistry. We learned, you know, fluid flow, et cetera, et cetera. I go into industry and suddenly there's this whole bunch of new stuff we have to learn, but we have, I had a basis for that. And that seems like kind of the, I don't know, the, the time tested model that, that people have settled on. Yeah. Mm. So settled on maybe in a, you know, it, since we, we started basically mass education as the dorm. I wonder like to what extent the way that they- oh, No, it. even before that. I mean, like to the extent that there's ever been education, there's always like some basic curriculum that's like, okay, you need to be familiar with everything. You need to have, you know, like even the old like grammar schools, universities back in the 12th century and so on. Like it's, it's going to be this- Sure, the, sure. Yeah. The education that format cetera. does this. Yeah. I, I guess I'm thinking more of like in, in- learning relationships where it is much more explicitly apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder, like, I, I, you can still kind of see hints of this, right, in uh, maybe social fraternities, for example, where you're trying to learn the cues and histories and so on of a particular community. Um, anyway, so yeah, th th this is sort of the, the model I had in my head here. Um, I know, Wolf, you had another question, though. Yeah. Uh, perhaps you should get to. Yeah, so, um... You've mentioned uh, in the past that it's hard to find other intellectually curious and capable people to work with. Um, what's, what do you think is causing this? Uh, you also mentioned like sort of potential problems with education with what people are being taught and so on. So is it just education or is there sort of cultural factors around that? Are the peaks of ability just inherently rare? Um, and, and what did you mean uh, by that? Right, so I, that was probably a pretty obnoxious thing to say. Like, I, I don't mean to say like- <laughs> right. There's this property that, for example, I have that like most people do not have. It's more that, um, uh, like, I think I think most people have some dogma, and like I also have some dogma. So maybe it's more that like it's hard to find people who are fully intellectually curious about everything. And I would I wouldn't even put myself in that bucket. Like I think that that's a really hard state to attain. Um, and and so like. Uh, like, yeah, I think like everyone just has some intellectual dogma that they they like um, believe implicitly, and then they have some set of things that they aren't curious about yet, and so it's hard for them to actually learn about those things because they, they don't have like the desire to interrogate them. Um, and I, I kind of like personally view a lot of learning as like becoming more and more curious about more and more things, and and kind of like if I'm curious about something, I know that I'll learn it, um, but if, if not that, I, and then I can't. And I'm not never really quite sure like what will unlock the curiosity. It's like always some like semantic hmm. kind of like aha moment. Um, that maybe somebody else is curious about something, then it infects me. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's like a combination of it's hard to be curious about everything, and that like it's it's just kind of it's something psychological. It's hard about that, and then also kind of this idea that yeah, we all have dogmas that we kind of subscribe to implicitly um, that we don't really question, and we're we're very rigid when we're like kind of, kind of questioned about, um, and that that that's a, a barrier to kind of like intellectual uh, sort of exploration. I think. Um, yeah, well, I guess I guess then there's two things going on there. One is uh, just if you're curious about a particular set of topics, it's going to be hard to find someone who is also curious about those particular topics. 
And then the other thing is to develop curiosity, sort of there needs to be that aha moment that, that somehow sparks your curiosity where you realize that knowledge in this area is important to you and that you can go out and get that knowledge. Like there's a bunch of kind of moving pieces if you think about it inside your head that you'd have to have in place to actually be curious about something. Yeah, like I, I think a, a friend, um, and there's, there's a cool counterpart that I've talked about in the past that, that a friend went to me to, which was that like, you should have a model for everything. Um, and I, I remember like hearing that and I was like, no, I, I don't need a model for everything. Like I, I don't understand anything about certain topics. So I, I couldn't assume anything. I should, I should not have a model for those things. But then I realized that like, my model explicitly was that I didn't care about that thing because I didn't have a model of it. And also that the probability of like X or Y happening was like 50-50. So like by definition, I have a model of everything in the world. Um, the question is just like, do you make that model explicit in your mind and try to update it whenever you get like new information? Um, right. And you like, always have a model; it just might be a bad one. <laughs> yeah. Right, well, exactly. and you trust yeah. yourself that you can work with trial and error, I guess, right? Like that that you will be able to update when you can or when you need to. Right. You have to believe that you won't like actively update in the wrong direction overall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to make right. Yeah. yeah. So in, in terms of finding intellectually interesting people, though, uh, you know, I, I've seen this term uh, forgotten Einsteins and so on, right? The idea that like there are a lot of people who are kind of could be doing much more interesting things, but are trapped for various reasons, maybe un unable to work on stuff. Um, what are the best strategies you found for uh, tracking down the sorts of people that you want to work with or do research with? Uh, and, you know, like how many missing Einsteins do you think are out there? Um, I, I would say actually, I, so I, I don't, having just said that I, I always should have models or anything, like my wife, Christine, really don't really have a good model of this. Um, but like there, there's kind of a funny thing that's happened where, um, because I post about like a lot of really random and esoteric topics, like really, really random stuff that like nobody mm -hmm. who's normally in tech would be kind of like fascinated by. Um, the people who tend to email me, like almost none of them are people looking for like money or advice in some weird way. They're right. like you know, people who are like, hey, like I also have been thinking a lot about like how HP like influences the definition of life, and you know, let, let's talk about that. And here's like five paragraphs and like you know things that I've written up. And and so um, and a lot of these people, if you Google them, which I have because I'm just curious, like there's nothing about them online. Like they're just like people who are working on these really interesting things, seemingly extraordinarily intelligent, very curious, um, and they're just kind of like I, I just like, have no idea who they are, or where they are, but. I mean, given the number that I receive on a monthly basis, I'm, yeah, it just, it, it's a lot higher than my baseline model of like, you know, sort of that Einstein's or sports Spur would be. Um, I, I think there's, there's something where like one interesting thing about Einstein is if you read his biography, he was quite tenacious person. Like he didn't just kind of fall into a nice professorship. You know, he like had a very hard teenager. There's actually a great uh, na National Geographic. It's like the best TV series ever, National Geographic Einstein, if you like, and it's like correct too, like if you want to like understand his life. Um, but like he, he, when he was a teenager, you know, sort of uh, was abandoned by his family, you know, had to go to Italy for, you know, various reasons, was sort of, you know, bouncing in and out of, of sort of um, different, different places. And, you know, in, in college, for example, he, he didn't get this incredible professorship out of college. He, he went and worked in the patent office. And like, if you really kind of read a lot about his life, it's like, that wasn't a great time for this dude. He was in like dire circumstances. And yet he still published like four seminal papers in different areas of physics that like influence where we are today. So I, I think like, to me, Einstein doesn't mean somebody who's smart. It means somebody who's able to overcome like incredible adversity and basically no support and just because they're so intellectually curious that they can, you know, they, they can't damn well stop. Like they'll just, they'll just keep mm -hmm. going along a certain idea train until like they, they kind of come to this um, under, understanding. And I think that's to me like a, a better heuristic for an Einstein, like someone who's just plain smart. Um, well, and I think right. something people overlook about Einstein is that like beyond the scientific brilliance, he was very, very good at building communities around himself and also at like political connection making, right? And so um, I, I think that there are a lot of people that I run into who are working on interesting stuff, but they, they either undervalue or I think don't know how to build um, a community of like valuable collaborators around themselves. So you look at people like Jack Parsons, right, the, the rocket scientist, and he's, you know, in, in this weird time where it seems like everyone in the spotlight in American culture seems to know each other. You know, he knows everyone working in rocketry. He's into a bunch of like weird occult stuff. He knows everyone there. Um, I, and, and those are the people I think who we end up hearing about because, you know, uh, 
when they come together, uh, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. um, so like, have you found that kind of intentional community building to be important to you? Um, like, you know, when you make these connections, do they often translate into something more permanent? Yeah, completely. I mean, um, I, I think most of my intellectual growth has come from like two people in my life and then like a smaller subset of like 20 people. And those people are not in my field. They, they don't have any shared interests directly scientifically. Um, they are just extremely rigorous thinkers who like have a style that I really admire um, and they're both close friends. So um, yeah, I, I, I would say, and I, I've lived with both of them in the past. So like, I mean, I'd say just like these really close friendships have, have influenced at least my life a lot. Um, and, and like, it's interesting that you said that because if you go back to, for example, Darwin, it was also true that his political connections really influenced like his career. So, I mean, he had this club called the X Club that would meet every month um, to kind of control the royal society, like help, you know, um, control decisions were made. And that really allowed him to take the preeminent kind of role as the discoverer of like natural selection as a mechanism for evolution, whereas Alfred Russell Wallace, who was like off, you know, in some other part of the world, who sent his manuscript to Darwin to be published, didn't have his connections. And, you know, nobody knows his name now, but he came up with the same idea at the same time. Mm. Well, it's interesting you mentioned the Royal Society because, um, you know, with life extension, uh, I've, I've had a number of uh, friends and acquaintances who've like been in this, in looking at this as a field over the years. And my impression has always been that um, the structure, the social structure seems to be something like a number of informal goal-based groups, right? They're interdisciplinary. Um, you know, there's people from all kinds of backgrounds. Some are self-taught, some aren't. Uh, but they're all able to come together and then generate these really interesting insights. And it, when I look at um, the history, you know, like, like things like the Royal Society or physics in the 20th century, those kinds of groups seem to be big drivers um, of, of what's going on in those fields. Like, so I, I'm interested, do you think that in, in life extension, um, you've seen, do you see those kinds of communities as like the driver of the unique ideas and the kind of non-mainstream stuff that has now become more visible? Yeah, I, I think um, there's kind of a couple subsets. One is, you know, advocacy groups who just kind of state repeatedly that we should all live longer if we live longer in a healthy way. And um, I, I think that's helpful. I, I'm, I'm not really sure how to measure whether that's helpful, but like there's a lot of people who just care about the issue itself and are very mission oriented. And then there's a separate subset of people who are extremely curious. And I think it's interesting because like there's some overlap, but some of the people in the latter subset actually couldn't care less whether we live longer or shorter. They just have this extreme curiosity about the idea of aging, about different facets of it. Um, and they're just driven to kind of untangle and understand it. And that group tends to just talk about technical matters a lot. Um, uh, and it's a very fun set of, of kind of I think people who fall into that, that group. Um, so yeah, in, in life kind of has the, those two major subsets, um, but, but, but they're not completely overlapping. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, w with your VC work, you become, I think something like a steward, um, for the life extension community, at least in being able to fund, um, projects that you find interesting and so on. So, you know, given that there is this infrastructure of interesting, innovative groups uh, of, of people researching, working together. Um, you know, my sense is that there is this goal now of scaling some of these up into something more like institutions. D do you think about how the, like the, the innovative juices, so to speak, can be sustained? Like um, with this in productive kind of intellectual culture that exists, will it survive uh, becoming institutions rather than just research groups? So um, it, it's funny you should ask. So I, I'm in Los Alamos right now in, in New mm. Mexico. Um, and the reason I'm here is because, well, it's, it's a fascinating place to be historically. This is where, you know, the Manhattan Project was conceived of. Right. Um, or sorry, it wasn't where it was conceived, it was where it was executed. Mm. But the, the reason I'm fascinated by it here is because uh, of the man who ran the project, Robert Oppenheimer. He chose New Mexico because he used to have a ranch here when he was a kid. Um, he liked the area for its aesthetic kind of qualities. There was no real pragmatic reason for him to come here. It was really kind of an aesthetic thing. And um, you know, we're talking really about Schopenhauer and you know the Eastern uh, kind of writings. He, you know, Oppenheimer was capable of reading Sanskrit directly mm. and um, would quote the Bhagavad Gita and interviews about the atomic bomb. And I think when people talk about the Manhattan Project, they often talk about 
the money that went into it or the talent that was collected or the logistics of the operation. Um, but if you, if you kind of read or watch documentaries about it, people will kind of say, well, this can never really have happened without, without um, Poppy. Or it, it, he's cited as somebody who really brought it together. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I was fascinated in my early 20s by him as kind of just an example of like a unique set of characteristics, like a, a kind of art, artistic sensibility and also like this like organizational skill that, that I, I, I just thought was really cool. And, and my model currently is kind of that that is required for great, a truly great institute or organization that it's pretty much all about that person. Um, and, and I haven't right. done a complex study of this, so maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but I, I think I've always just been struck and very biased personally by like encountering like him when I was like in my early twenties as an example of this person who like did this great thing and being like, that person is unlike anybody I've ever seen before. And I want to understand like how they came to be. Um, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that's that's very related to uh, Samuel Burya's ideas of the great founder, like the institutions come about because there's some great founder who sort of champions the idea and actually builds it up. Um, mm -hmm. the, the counterpart to this, though, would be that Oppenheimer later did, you know, run the IAS, which was supposed to be this great font of wisdom. And it's commonly cited, you know, that Einstein went there and was unproductive and that kind of, you know, all these people went there and didn't do much. Um, and I'm not sure if that's true, oh, yeah. I'm not a physicist per se, but kind of <laughs> that would be the most direct uh, sort of uh, argument against. Uh, so that, that's the Institute for Integral Studies. The, I, I've definitely heard that anecdote that, that people go there and then they, they stop publishing useful stuff. Right, it, maybe in a hundred years it'll turn out that actually the best work was done there, but, um, but at least I, I guess by like some- Oh, advanced, Inter Institute for Advanced Studies, is that? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. sorry, I got the wrong one. There's another one. I, I don't want to speak badly about the wrong institution. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, um, but you're right. The most hopeful <laughs> version of this is that they actually went there and did a bunch of amazing work and uh, it was just, you know, put put in classified sections or something and we haven't heard of it. Right, 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 right. Um, yeah, it, yeah it, so it is uh, true though. I, like there is this thing that happens where when things become institutionalized and, you know, I, I, often it will be when an initial founding generation kind of retires or dies out and you know uh, you know one can still look at los alamos for example um any number of institutions where uh the or nasa maybe you know where the, the vision of the founding generation doesn't seem to have lasted but i i think you're pointing at something interesting here where even people who have previously done great work and kind of die uh intellectually uh or, or you know in terms of their productivity if they're put into the wrong kind of institution after like you can't just centralize a bunch of geniuses together and necessarily depend uh, on them working on stuff. So I, I've got a question um, about your interest in life extension. So it seems like there's sort of two major approaches or I guess I, I categorize it into two major approaches to life extension, which you might broadly term lifestyle and technology. Um, I have some questions about both. So on the lifestyle angle, um, some of the lifestyle changes that life extensionists have advocated for years, like fasting and calorie restriction, have now been much more widely recognized. Um, there's also work on, I, I think, in the anti-aging effects of nutrition and exercise with multiple schools of thought there. Um, and it seems like some people managed to stay young, you know, almost into their 70s, uh, perhaps due to their lifestyle. What do you think are the best established lifestyle changes for long and productive health span? Um... I mean, I, I think sort of um, it'd be hard to give you like a, a well-weighted model of, of how I actually view this because anything that I tell you, if I, if I say mm -hmm. one specific thing, you might think, okay, I will do that thing. That is obviously a good thing to do. Um, but my actual model for this is like very low probability, question mark, personalized each kind of intervention across like a broad spectrum with a lot of priors around like mouse stuff translating, which like if like one piece of evidence were to turn out false, like wouldn't wouldn't really work. Um, like for example, there's a recent study that kind of debunks intermittent fasting, but like if you actually look at it closely, it doesn't really debunk it, but then like it doesn't provide right. positive evidence for it. So like you know, what would our actual part, part be there? Um, I think the one thing to just watch might be this um, idea of low protein diets. Um, I, I'm not suggesting them per se, like I, I think, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to really walk back how strongly I suggest things like this, but um, there's some interesting like molecular mechanisms that might lead you to believe that low protein could turn on beneficial pathways genetically. And there's mouse evidence that like if you change the percentages of a mouse's diet in lots of different ways, 
decreasing protein is one of the most kind of common ways to make mycelium longer. Additionally, mm. decreasing just, for example, the thionine, so like one amino acid, not just all protein, can also increase lifespan up to a point. Um, and I just think that's an interesting, that, that, that's a really interesting kind of like observation, but it, it doesn't mean you should do low protein diet. I'm just saying as a right. scientist, that's enough to support my interest in like that, that idea. Right. Um, the other sort of, I think, less commonly noted um, thing, which is potentially important is this idea that like food sensing is actually important. So like if you do different experiments in flies or, or, or like, um, uh, or, or worms, we kind of see that like when neurons that sense food are activated, sometimes it can impact lifespan. So it's not just eating the food, it's that you sense the food is there that somehow like affects lifespan. Um, Interesting. And so I think there's some idea that like maybe um, sort of being careful, not like how much you eat as much, like that, you know, for, for one, but also, you know, like that when you eat is sort of, you know, thought about like when you sense food is thought about, again, I, I couldn't give you a prescription for this and it might not actually be useful or important. I, I just sort of like, there's enough evidence to make that interesting. Um, but yeah, sorry, I, I have to really walk back all, cause like basically right, right. It, it, also the last thing is sort of, there, there's a, there's a, this baseline assumption that I think a lot of people have that it should be easy, that like diet should be an easier thing to reason about um, than, than other stuff. And, and kind of my pushback there would be, we're just starting to pull out the effect of hundred atom molecules on our systems given like, you know, hundreds of thousands of kind of persons worth of data for, and you know, individual drugs yeah. and kind of the idea that like a complex heterogeneous um, kind of like ill characterized like sort of trillion cell sort of like mush that you consume at like a you know different time on a daily basis so that should be easier to characterize the impact of that on your system than like these drugs that we're still trying to figure out how they work um, I, I think diets actually you know far more complex in that sense it's like mm -hmm. it, it's not just like protein fat and carbohydrate it's like you know trillions of molecules um, that you're yeah. adjusting simultaneously which will understand the effect of like one um, yeah. So. But on the other hand, there's also some fairly low dimensional wisdom here. I mean, and especially like adjusted throughout the ages. Like I remember I was reading something the other day from a 14th century uh, Arab philosopher where he's noting, oh yeah, the people who live in the desert and fast all the time and mostly eat uh, meat and cheese, they live really long and they're really healthy as compared to like the, the urban people who eat more like grains and so on. Um, so stuff like that that's kind of like attested throughout the ages. And then there's obviously things just like, you know, people who eat more protein, they're just like taller and stronger, things like that. Um, I, I and so there's, go for yeah, it. So just a couple people be like, well, the fact that we're still arguing about this today and it's not clear really what's like, like there, there's no societal level agreement or even scientist level agreement exactly on like what the answer to this is. I think we push back on that point. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, diet's certainly difficult, but yeah, I, I see some patterns, but definitely it's, it's, there isn't very well established uh, rules, it seems, at least in the scientific literature. So, um, Ash, do you want to ask about the yeah, technology? Well, I, I had a follow up on that too. Like it, it seems like Wolf and even the examples you gave part, you know, the role of stress even on the human body is something that I find interesting here, right? Both the stress of, you know, caloric restriction, right? Um, intermittent fasting, like the soft version of this, but you go on, on three day fasts and, you know, I, I've, I've, re I've read about like, oh, this has positive effects on, um, you know, the, the cellular waste built up in your system. Um, you have obviously the stress put on you by uh, things like exercise. So like Laura, from, from your end, I'm interested in hearing how like the, the role of controlled regular stress on the human body um, mm -hmm. is, is being looked at. Because like on, on the one hand, obviously you can look at people who spent 50 years of their life doing hard labor and mining and so on, and, and probably their bodies have been a lot more negatively impacted. So is there like an optimal stress level um, that <laughs> is being thought about here? Like how is this working? Um, so I think there's like, this is not a field that I'm expert in, like the, the, the field of like hermesis or like the effect of stress on like aging systems is like, like, like basically my expertise technically specifically is like in aging genetics and like mm. most other things I have like some baseline working knowledge of and like I've seen a fair amount of companies in, but like it's not, I, I'm not like the equivalent of like a professor on like talking about like that sure, subject. Sure. So with this, for example, I mean, like what we know is that there are many case studies of hermetic effects, which means like you literally try and poison something a little bit in different ways. And it's not clear like which, for which like types of comments is true and for which it isn't, but like, um, you, you give like a, a small, like sort of uh, hypothetically bad thing to an organism and in a small dose it helps and then you give a larger dose and it, it hurts. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's fairly well characterized. There, there's, there's this confusing kind of um, phenomenon in aging where 
people thought that mitochondria, for example, you know, were spewing out kind of these negative oxidative kind of free radicals and that, that was causing aging and then later realized that like those actually didn't correlate to aging as much and that if you mop them up quickly, um, they might actually have been serving some signaling purpose. So like maybe that, that damage is actually useful as, as, as kind of a, 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 a heuristic. Um, but yeah, sorry, I, I don't think I've good answer to questions that sort of I would imply that I understood like fully how aging works. Sure. <laughs> like, 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 like the equation, like what is the correct amount of damage to live like the longest is one that we haven't really solved yet. Sure, well, we, we can move then. Um, we have a lot of questions coming into the Q&A. So I think perhaps Wolf, we could make this a final question from our end and then uh, have a little more time for the community yeah, that sounds good as well. Cool. Um, and, and also, can I just interject quickly? I, I'm really sure. sorry. I know it's very annoying to be like, this is very obvious. And I'd also like an answer on it and to have somebody who like purports like know something about a field be like, well, like, but we don't really know. It's kind of like that quote about economists and like two hands. But um, mm -hmm. I think the, the thing is just like in aging, um, the things you're asking about are actually the things that I have less confidence in us knowing a lot about. The things that you haven't asked about because they're, they're not kind of like in part of the normal discourse that I think are the most fascinating parts of aging. Um, have to do with the genetic, like like the like the fact that we now have clear evidence of genetic pathways that cross the species barrier that increase lifespan when when mutated, and that this is very consistent um, across worms and mice and flies, and even dogs seemingly have this kind of correlation, this inverse correlation between size and lifespan that mirrors what you predicted from worms, and that this all comes from like random eugenic worm studies in the 1980s and 1990s, that, like what you'd never have guessed would have translated mm -hmm. in that way, and so like that there's this kind of like weird like high amount of evidence. Um, that we never could have predicted we would see that we've seen in the past few decades that has led us to believe that aging is malleable. And, so is and this research that has been rediscovered now or what was it kind of done and then being continually worked <laughs> on and we're just now getting the results? I mean, no, it just takes a really long time to like frenzy this mm. stuff. So I mean, can, can I give like a two minute screen? On, of like, course, what happened in aging? of course, go for it. I, I just want to defend our field. I want to be like, we do know like some things. Um, so, so basically uh, back in the 1980s, uh, there was not a lot known about aging. There had been some probiosis studies, you know, in, in different kind of like Russian labs. There, there had been um, a study in the 1930s, um, or maybe a little bit later than that, on caloric restriction. But like, there, we didn't really sort of study aging professionally. Well, the, the NIA existed, but like, um, I, I, aging definitely wasn't a vogue kind of feel as it is somewhat increasingly now today. Yeah. And these scientists kind of wanted to ask a, a question, which was, okay, so first they made an observation, which is if you, if you look in worms at different kind of species of worms, you'll see that some live longer than others and they're genetically mm -hmm. different. And so they had this question, which was, are the genetic drivers of these differences in lifespan between these different worm species? And so to try and understand this better, um, they did a random screen, which is back in the day, like we didn't have all these cool new sequencing te technologies um, that are really fast and cheap that we have today. You had to like, do genetic screens to figure out what, what caused stuff like this. So they took a bunch of, I think it was like x-rays or some other type of mutagenic ray, and they basically just blasted worms with these like mutagenic rays um, to look for mutants that were randomly occurring um, that increased, that, that were living longer than kind of the, the worms had been previously before they were mutated. And they found a gene called uh, later age one, um, which when mutated, it increased lifespan by about 50%. And so in like 1980, in like the late 1980s, this was like the first ever discovery of a gene that like coded for lifespan in any animal. And so it was like, okay, that's interesting. Um, but C. elegans has this property, which is that it hibernates. So they kind of said, okay, well, we may live longer, but like this worm species also hibernates. So we're not really sure if this is relevant to, you know, like anything that doesn't hibernate, for example, us. Um, and so later, uh, my old sort of mentor, who is, you know, one of the leaders in this field, um, did another screen, found another gene called DAF2, which in that time by about twofold. And for, for that sort of uh, gene, it's actually the same sort of pathway as the first gene. So it's like, not only do you do two different random screens, and you find two different genes which increase lifespan by about the same order of magnitude, but also those two genes are in the same pathway. Um, kind of like one is an upstream receptor of a downstream kinase, where the kinase was the first one found. And so then it was like, okay, this is interesting. Then in 1996, um, they tried mutating that same kind of gene or the homologous gene in, in mice, and they saw about a 60% increase in lifespan. Um, the interesting thing about this gene is it's actually a gene that also encodes for um, growth or kind of like this, this kind of um, path, the signaling pathway also affects growth. So these mice were actually dwarf mice, um, but they had an increased longevity phenotype of about 60%. Um, and, you know, if you go look at dogs, uh, if you own a dog, there's some exception to this, but you'll know that like big dogs live on, you know, sort of average, maybe about half as long as smaller dogs. And this is... Um, potentially correlated with the same mutations that gave rise to this kind of phenotype that was first discovered in the 1980s. And so you kind of have this like really beautiful story um, across the species barrier of, you know, finding an aging gene, reproducing it from like worms, which are these thousand cell organisms, super tiny, up to mice, which have bones, blood, fur, like all this other stuff 
that is totally different from like, like you know, these worms live like 25 days and, and mice live like two plus years, right? And so just like, there's no reason why this should translate, but it did and we predicted that it would. Um, and, and so I think like when like we talk about why we're fascinated by this field, A, it's the fact that like we're finding more pathways like this and these are the kinds of things that we're good at drugging. Um, I don't think ultimately these are going to be the ways that we impact longevity overall because they're just like not likely to lead to like, you know, unbound sort of, you know, effect. they probably have some cap that we don't really know about or haven't characterized, but they, they work. Like they're, they're, they're empirically like very, very interesting and we can drug them today. We have drugs in fact in humans today that target these pathways and we're currently characterizing whether those drugs are actually making people live longer or not. Or there, there are many attempts to start trials to do this in human to actually understand whether we are actually changing human lifespan today in ways that we don't even mm. understand. In um, terms of the, you know, the, the lifespan expansion, extension here versus biological aging, I'm interested to hear, um, is it basically uh, in the tests that have been done on, on, on worms and mice and so on, as you're saying, um, is it pure lifespan extension or are you actually able to slow biological aging as well um, in these tests? Yeah, so we should really, the field should really come up with a name that would force anybody who hears the word to like never imagine a situation in which like you live longer and also be like decrepit and, and kind of like, like mm. the, you, you could imagine things that can make you live longer. Um, actually like many modern therapies probably play this role and like keep you in bad health, but we're not right. interested in those at all because nobody would ever want, yeah. like that would be like torture or something to induce a state or not necessarily torture, but like it would, it would definitely be a suboptimal um, state. Uh, well, what many of these therapies, not all of them show is an increase in fitness. So if for example, you look at like Cynthia's worms, um, in later life, they, uh, like most worms, when they get to be really old, if you look at them through a microscope, they're like, sort of like, they're sitting around, they're not like really moving, they kind of like move their fearing sometimes. But, you know, her worms, the DAF2 worms mutated, are still swimming around in a jolly fashion, kind of, you know, about two times later than a, a worm normally would. And so they have increased, if you just look at them, you can visually see like the increased longevity. That's what, that's what we look for as a field. Mm. Yeah, well, we, we had um, Prince Michael of Liechtenstein on the salon recently, who is, of course, also someone interested in longevity. His perspective was he was more interested in the question of slowing biological aging. He had yeah. a lot of, um, I think, uh, thoughts to share about this on how this impacts human society, obviously. What does it mean for us to, um, you know, be, be able to work and live uh, a full life up until 80, 90 years old? What for you uh, is the driver um, like when we look at the idea of, of, of life expansion applied to human beings, um, you know, of, there's obviously an, an immediate reason that we don't want to die very soon, that we like it. But do you think that there is like a social reason um, that we're fascinated by this? So like I could imagine, for example, in a society where we all live much longer, that it would take longer for these generations to uh, transfer between each other, right? We kind of see this generation conflict right now. I, I guess I'm interested just in how much you think about like the social aspect of these questions that you're doing scientific work on. Yeah, so I think um, it's funny because like people often ask like what I think about economic issues and sort of my answer usually is like, well, I, I just have like absolutely no idea. Like I, I, I barely know anything about biology and like it's been like a decade in the field or something like, well, how, how could I possibly know enough about like social issues comment? But like, I think the one thing that, it, that I, I do have pretty strong conviction around is um, we didn't like our current lifespan is, is completely arbitrary, right? There's there, like, I, I think you can be for or against dying. Like I, I think there, there might be arguments on either side of that, but like to like state that like the current number of years that we live is like the optimal number is completely ridiculous. It's like saying like that knees were like, you know, manufactured in an optimal way. Like knees are obviously like very terrible, right? Like they, they're, mm -hmm. they're very suboptimal for what their job is supposed to be. And in the same way, like our lifespan was, you know, sort of evolved in a completely different setting than the one that we inhabit today. And based on parameters that have nothing to do with optimal style function. And so I think like, for me, the interesting question is like, what is the optimal lifespan? Like it, it might not be infinite, but it probably, it definitely isn't, you know, like, 75 or some arbitrary number, you know, that, that, that we have right now as kind of a time scale to set like our whole society. Um, mm. So you do think so there I, could be like a suboptimal length on the other side, like we could live too long still? Uh, certainly. I, I, I don't know how to think about that, but, but, but my, my only certainty is that our current randomly set kind of baseline number of years that we all live um, without being able to choose is definitely incorrect. Like it's definitely not the optimal for whatever utility function you want to put on society. Um, just, just because like it, it was evolved for you know completely different reason than to like maximize human flourishing today in our current environment. So I, I mean maybe the correct lifespan is a shorter one. I, that's a possibility, but I, I just know that our default wasn't set with that kind of in mind.
Um, so b before we go to the Q&A, uh, I, I have one sort of open-ended question on the, the sort of technical interventions. It sounds like it's what you're actually interested in. Um, there's a few things kind of happening. Um, I, I think some people have mentioned metformin or senolytics, various like interventions people are proposing for working on humans to, uh, to slow down aging or, or otherwise increase health span. Uh, what is the most promising in your eyes, was the most promising intervention uh, for anti-aging in humans that's currently being worked on or could be worked on? Oh, um, I, I don't think I'd actually say, sorry, <laughs> like, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's reasons that I wouldn't say it, but yeah, I, I think recently, there's, there's one that I'm evolution right now, but I, I just think it, if I said it, people would take it and they, they really shouldn't. Um, okay. and, and also it's just, yeah, I'm still figuring out, but like, yeah, there, 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 there's a couple of humans right now that I think are, are very interesting to look at. Um, so yeah. Okay. So are there people that, experimenting with, with those things that are like going to end up living to 200 or something? Uh, no. or, or is this more like just early trials of something? No. So I, I think there's a, there's an important last concept here, sorry, which, which is that like, um, people have this idea that like there's one silver bullet and right. in the field. I think we have much higher conviction than most people publicly would have that there is a like cure for aging either out there or on the way. But I think the conviction we have is tied to also the idea that it's very, very, very low like um, in impact. So like I think w what we're excited about is the ability to measure a statistically significant increase in lifespan, but it's right. probably going to be super small um, right. just because the first therapy will be very suboptimal. Um, we, we just I think have higher conviction than most people that it's it's going to happen. And for the longer, like kind of, you know, like decades or, or, or more kind of interventions, I, I don't have any good model for when those will come out. I, my only models that are high conviction are around like the kind of interventions that will probably work, but like, or work more than you might expect for like such a broad claim, but like have a low magnitude. Okay. Um, Is there anything happening that's a waste of time that people are focusing on too much? Oh, of course. I mean, in any field, I think you have attractors where, uh, there's kind of a few gene names that attract a lot of research or other things like that. Um, I think there's a huge dearth of like work on sort of asking quantitative questions um, in ways that are decorrelated from work that's been done in aging previously. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's, that's probably something that every field has. Mm -hmm. So uh, we should move to the audience Q and A. Um, we have a number of questions in the box. Uh, so Keep adding, upload your favorite ones. Uh, we're going to start with a question from Jason. Uh, so kind of higher level question here, does longevity overall receive less attention, funding, and interest than it deserves? Uh, and if so, why? You know, especially given, you know, we, we presumably all want to live longer. Um, why would it be underfunded? Yeah, so I, I can give kind of a um, personal case study on this. Um, I first came into the field about uh, a decade ago now actually um, with, with the fund and it was very different. And the, the reason that I run a venture fund, I mean, I, I'm a scientist at heart, like I, I love science, but the reason I'm running a venture fund is because at that time um, it seemed like money was the biggest obstacle to get things moving. Um, that's changed a fair amount. There's now kind of like billions floating around the field. It's seen as like a accepted area to invest in. But um, I, 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 I could tell you that like stage one of the, we are not investing longevity kind of sort of issues was people just didn't see it as a real field. Like it, it just wasn't obvious that there was real science here if you weren't very, very deep in the field and very embedded in like the details of the research. Um, and so like aging companies weren't seen as investable for a long time. And this kind of interesting thing happened where a lot of people started, you know, investing in the, in the companies. Some of them had, you know, some mouse data was interesting and then more money came in. But then I think the thing that really flipped the bit was like Art Levinson sort of jumping from Genentech and being this like, you know, sort of figure in the field to an aging company that was just focused on aging or at least hypothetically just focused on aging. That was a massive deal. Um, that was like a big stamp of like approval that this was a real field now. So like the social credibility I think was much actually potentially more important than like the financial credibility because the, the, the latter kind of followed the former. Um, yeah, and, then, and that but, seems, that, that also seems common I think to a lot of fields that it kind of needs to be granted uh, the, the public status or the public imprimatur, right? That this is a legitimate field um, and, you know, may, maybe get people to jump over to actually work in it um, from anything else that they could be doing. 
That's really talk. interesting what it says about investing and finance, though, that that like it's not a bunch of these contrarian investors who are sort of making bets uh, contrary to what everyone else is thinking, but it's it's much more like going along with with uh, what's considered to be legitimate. Yeah, um, I yeah, I mean that, but, but well, I mean so, but this is the whole point there. It's like I, I started an aging venture fund, like a specialty fund, because it re requires that amount of focus right. to do good investing in this area. And if you don't have that amount of focus, it, it's very hard to know a whole field deeply, or even hire somebody who could know the whole field um, and, and give you good investment advice. So I, I don't blame general investors for not being able to right. invest it. But the other thing I'd say, though, is, yes, there is currently a massive um, under allocation of resources to one specific problem, which is running the first aging trial. This is kind of a major milestone that the field is running towards. It's this idea that we'll, for the first time, assay aging directly in humans in the next decade or, or coming decade. And that this is you know, physically possible to do. We kind of you know, have the momentum scientifically to imagine what, what we should do for it. Um, it's a clear goal. It's, there's, there's nothing kind of that... Um, what's out in the way of it. Uh, and there's really, it, people have struggled, or so, 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 still struggling to raise money for it, to design the trial, to run the trial. And this is the biggest milestone in the field. Um, that and also kind of um, finding a good biomarker for aging. Something Kristen Forty from BioAge, I think, identified very early is like um, just finding a cheap and efficient way to measure aging um, is it, probably one of the most underinvested in things that isn't being done right now. So on that question of the first big trial, the, presumably that'll be some kind of experiment. What do you think that experiment will be? So there's a couple of different forms this experiment could take. One is uh, attempting to assay whether an existing on-market uh, drug, um, presumably with a very, very good safety profile, is actually impacting aging in a measurable way and just getting kind of extraordinary number of people tracked across a very long period of time to assay this. Um, I, I'm personally still trying to figure out where this is statistically this is like probable or just kind of like worth doing, but like might will probably fail, like given the expected like magnitude of impact. Um, but but that that's just one kind of intervention based trial. And then another version of this would be to kind of look at um, you know, new biomarkers to try and find new biomarkers of aging, but um, independent of either of those, I think it's just it I've said this for like, you know, years, it's like the um, the hallmark, the like the, the next major thing in the field will be this trial. And basically nobody who comes to the aging field knows that this is kind of like, but everyone in the field knows that like this is, this is one of those things that, that would change everything um, if we did. It would show that it's possible to change this in humans deterministically. Um, and it would give us a lot of information as to like what that would look like. Um, right, and what the trade-offs are and all that. I'm interested if you think this trial will happen in America or elsewhere. Um, I'm just let's see, like I, I think everybody who's currently considering running it, like there, there are many professors at like great universities who are like, trying to like been trying for you know years to raise on the order of 70 million dollars to run trials like this and um i think they really want the fda to sign off on aging as an indication and so they're trying to do everything to optimize for that and it's actually non-trivial to run the trial somewhere else just because like most other regulatory bodies look to the fda as a metric for what they should do so it's not clear that running it somewhere else would be a better idea necessarily um it might be cheaper and faster but like only by like, you know maybe several fold on those two parameters. So well, I know for example with AI, right? Like there there's this heated race between the U.S. and China. Um, you know uh, other countries that participate in it as well, but particularly China has been trying to uh, forge ahead and kind of like gain ground on the cutting edge stuff. Um, is the longevity research quite U.S. based? Like I, I don't really have a visibility on what's going out uh, outside of North America. Uh, could you paint that picture for us? Um. I, I think it's maybe my current model, like half US, half like a, a lot of it in Europe, actually, and and, and rest of the world. Um, and, and then for the most part, there's always like one like leader lab that's just in some random area. That, like, and like if you're the best in the field, you kind of go wherever you want and set up like the leading lab there. Um, but yeah, I, I'd say about like half of it maybe of, of, of the good work is in the US that, that I know of. Mm -hmm. and, we should jump uh, back to the Q&A then. So Natalia has a question. Um, for longevity, uh, do you think it is more important to study longevity as its own field um, or, or piecemeal? So for example, can we look at particular organs of the human body or particular systems in the human body individually and figure out um, how to slow damage or aging in them? Like how, how holistic is it uh, to, or how legitimate is it to think about longevity as kind of its own thing versus all these other health problems in the human body? 
Yeah, so um, the answer is both. Um, the, I think, correct way to try to find near-term viable interventions is to look for holistic um, sort of things. So to empirically look for interventions which um, slow down like most organ systems from aging um, because we have this prior that potentially there are these modular evolutionary like, uh, like evolved pathways that control aging to some degree. And that's kind of what you'd expect to see if you were finding one of those. Um, on, on the flip side, uh, there's this kind of statement that we should um, just try to engineer like the lack, like the sort of like immortal function of, of each organ. And, and I think like, to be honest, all I care about is the brain on some level, sort of just like, you know, past certain point, like what's the most important of the organs, it would, it would be the brain. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and the brain has a lot of specific interesting challenges. So it's so like, like I, I think it's a valid, I think that's the, that, 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 that's the more correct way to get to solution if you have unbounded time and resources. But like, if, you, if your goal is to get the therapy on market like in the next decade or so, um, a lot of the drug development tools that we have today would bias you to actually look for the simpler pathways, even if they're more lame for like, kind of like a long-term larger effect, if that makes sense. Um, and is that, I'm interested why you privilege the brain here. Is it just because you, you see that as kind of like the uh, kind of the seat of the person, I guess? Right. I mean, I, I, I'm no expert on genetic medicine, so like really speaking out of my depth here, but it, it just sort of seems like we're replacing more and more of like the other functions. And like, that's the one that we just know the least about. Um, might be the mm. hardest to, to mess with. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, so just sort of like an, an ignorant guess, which is like, you have, to, you have to have a model, right? You have to prioritize pray, pray, pray something. You should have an equal model over all organs. Um, okay, interesting. Uh, Wolf, do you want to take the next one? Yeah, so we have a technical question from Stephen Pimentel. He asks uh, your opinion of a, a list of uh, technical mechanisms. So rapamycin or other MTOR inhibition, inhibition, autophagy, cellular senescence, mitochondrial function, and chronotypes. Just how do these play into uh, the aging field or um. what's promising? I mean, I'm not really interested in any of those specifically. Like, I like, I, I think, I think that level of abstraction. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I, like, 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 there's like kind of a list of like now at this point, like hundreds of things that like we kind of track, and like those represent like the bottom quartile, maybe except for maybe autophagy uh, uh, of those items. So like interesting, but but not like we don't have a list of like five things of which those are the five things that we like you know track. Mm -hmm. but asking. Um, by tracking, you mean like the the sort of major mechanisms of aging that you're looking at and, and paying attention to when you're talking about kind of like the reliable indicators of aging or like pathways that you might intervene in? Yeah, I'm sorry, this is kind of complex. And I, I, I don't have like a, like a concise explanation of this, but like basically um, I think there's like this massive, and uh, Jose um, from the Nintel blog and I were actually talking about this recently and he, he had like had some good thoughts about it, which was like there, there's kind of this, this massive fallacy, which is that like uh, we understand aging well enough to like list like hallmarks or kind of like list like you know ways of understanding it, and so people will often like kind of pick specific things like um, uh, senescence or other things and say like this is the cause of aging. This is the one thing. This is like the one ring that like drives aging. Um, and I think my point is subtle. It's that like there are specific like things that we can do to holistically like reverse or prevent or slow aging that seem pretty like sort of broad um, that are like interventions. But that doesn't mean we understand the actual cause. Like you can intervene something without understanding like what actually causes it. And I think the cause is still like extraordinarily unclear. Um, like, like extraordinarily so. And like basically all of these like words like senescence or autophagy are like random things that we found when we changed them, increased the malplacement by like up to 20%. But like we don't know what that means in the field. Like we're not clear right. on that. So like whenever people ask about it, I always just die inside because it's like, yeah, we don't have Newton's laws for aging yet. Right. We have a bunch of stuff that like- So, so in some sense, the field is kind of pre-paradigmatic. Like there's sort of this distinction between research that's that's before you have a good paradigm for it and, and research after that. Like you so said, you're still in this phase of kind of collecting a lot of data, making observations, seeing a bunch of things that work and don't work and making stabs at theory, but you're not at the stage of like, here's how aging works. Um, and, and then working on that basis. Right, like my, my, my current best model for the field is basically like, we, you should take a strong position. You should like come up with a crazy, crazy model and like 
um, you know, like the, the crazier the better and like pursue it aggressively and like give it as much detail as possible so that you can knock it down and disprove it or like, you know, try and like, right. it will be true if it like were, were, were the case. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's right. And so like you, like you, you have to distinguish between like what people are saying and doing to like explore models versus like what you should, what your actual part should be is like how much we understand like the phenomenon itself. Mm -hmm. um, right. That, makes sense. That, that kind of, you know, um, given we were talking so much about education earlier, it makes me wonder, like if someone came to you and asked, uh, like, I want to learn about uh, anti-aging and, 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 and life extension, all these things, given that there aren't that many solid paradigms and laws to work with yet, like, what is the immediate thing that someone would want to do if they wanted to just learn about this as a field? Yeah, I'm telling them, don't start in the aging field. Like, whatever you do, for, like, for God's sake, do not start, like, in the mm. actual field. Like, like, go understand, like, physics and chemistry and biology and, like, quantitatively understand biology, because even that is, like, not taught very well in most places. And, like, mm -hmm. understand drug development and, like, focus for the most part on, like, what we can do to the human body. Like, what modalities are available if you're a drug developer to, like, actually use, like, impact from biology. And then maybe if you understand all of that, like, come up with some original ideas. And then maybe once you've done that, like, you can go look at the aging field, like, understand some of the basic, like, principles that people come up with there, and, like, just against different models. But, like, I would not start in the actual field. I think that's, like, the worst possible place to start. Like, so, like, learn the paradigms you can learn first and then figure out the downstream stuff that um, doesn't have a lot of paradigms built around it yet. Uh, sorry, if by paradigms you mean like models that we... I, I, I mean people. things that are more kind of like settled models that you can work with and explore yeah. on an elementary level and then look at the stuff which is still very experimental and unsettled. Yeah, I would say like learn biology. Like, the, like mo most people in biology do not have a fully good comprehensive model of biology. So like focus on that and then like, and, and then like you, you can understand the aging literature quickly and, and sort of I think we're not quickly but like you understand it like much better if you start there than if you start like in the field itself which I did and it took me a very long time to like reverse all the damage that that did um and, and like go back and like learn the fundamentals well um right again so this comes back to sort of our earlier discussion about kind of learning a broad base of fundamentals that allow you to reason about the world and reason about the whatever field you're going to go into before you attempt to learn all the specific knowledge um in, in the field right yeah. <laughs> um, I want to get to a, another question here that Pasha asked. Um, I'm, I'm going to expand a little bit. So Pasha's question was about uh, Taoism, which as, uh, is this intellectual tradition with a lot of focus on uh, longevity through meditation, traditional medicines, fasting, and so on. Um, and Pasha had asked whether you foresaw a revitalization of, of this tradition. I, I want to kind of expand that question a bit. Um, like there, there are kind of, you know, these traditional forms of medicine uh, that people will like to fall back on. Uh, we've kind of discussed things like fasting practices already. Um, how much engagement is there on a serious level with this stuff um, from people looking at life extension in uh, your community, right, from a more scientific perspective? Like, are these viewed as quite useful, like, like Chinese traditional medicine, for example, or, you know, is this kind of like, okay, there might be some good leads here, but we're not really going to rely on it very much. We're going to do the basic research on our end. Uh, for meditation, I would honestly have no idea. It's not, it's not like an area that I, I if, if meditation has been studied in the aging context, I honestly like, probably wouldn't know. Um, for mm. fasting, that, that's, that's been a core tenant of the aging field since like the 19, like the early 1900s. Mm. So, um, but I, I guess, is, is that something that um, the, the community started focusing on because of you know, research that was sort of being done, or was there any inspiration from, you know, these kind of older traditions of health and medicine that existed? Do you so know any of the that, lineage there? The story that I was told about how we first, like, studied CR was that there was the Great Depression, and we were worried that, like, if we ate less, we'd be worse off. And so we were studying, like, mm. how much less long you'd live if you fasted, and then they found that actually these rats live longer. I mean, I, I read the original paper, and I wasn't sure that was actually how, why it was made, but, like, that, yeah, the original, the story that I have for the beginning of the field is more, like, Will the Great Depression hurt like our longevity? And the answer was like surprising. Um, Interesting. Wow. So this is like lore on uh, anti-aging research at this point. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> um, I mean, ha has there been anything else like this that has, um, I, I guess, come up? Yeah. Like I I'm trying to think of you know, uh, you you can look at like, uh, you know, Wolf. I think already mentioned high fat diets. Um, you you have you know traditions uh, like. In, in Japan, for example, um, I think in Okinawa, right, there's this focus on close community social relations as actually an environment that can, um, f for, you know, whatever reasons, expand your lifespan. Like, is there anything else like this that has come up where it's like, wow, this, this practice has been very interesting uh, to study? 
Well, I mean, the one that always raises the eyebrows is like castration has been studied a bunch. So there's actually- Oh, really? Like, yeah, yeah. So like uh, in, in Cynthia's lab, uh, right after, or before I got there, there was um, this other like, or this other like um, sort of person that she had working on a project that nobody else would work on because they thought it was crazy. And like, if Cynthia has like, a, like an idea that sounds, you know, sort of like out there, like my, my career series, like you should work on it no matter what, like anybody tries to do in your way, because like, it's, it's probably really interesting. Um, and, her, and sort of the thing that she studied was whether if you knocked out uh, the gonad of worms, they live longer. Because there's been this idea that like, maybe there's a trade off between production and lifespan. Um, and she found that yes, like if you knock out, it's interesting, just the German egg cells of the worm, then they live about 60% longer than normal. But if you knock out the whole gonad, including the somatic covering, they actually don't live longer. Um, so it's like this very weird, like it's like a very weird, like regulated pathway. And there's this paper that people always cite from like um, a while ago, it was in a good journal, like looking at Korean eunuchs and like there's historical records, like in court of how long they lived. Um, and the claim is that compared to their like similar court contemporaries, they actually live longer or something like that um, by, a, by a fair amount. But this is also probably extremely confounded by like many things. So, yes, you know. I think uh, the applications would have some cost benefit analysis uh, to be done. <laughs> yeah. uh, so D Jeremy uh, asked another question. Um, communities of tinkers were a major force in mechanical advances during the industrial revolution. Um, so I, you know, people, I guess we think of today as like, uh, you know, mechanical hackers, essentially inventors. Um, do you see similar activity in biology or life extension? Um, so, you know, th this term biohacker has been thrown around on occasion. Um, but, but do you see people doing very interesting independent work or is, are most things happening in more established labs and research projects? Um, I, I think like to me the, the word biohacker is like I, I haven't met anybody who's like a biohacker who's like extremely competent and like it's amazing they're not in a lab like they really should be like you know right it's like most right. people that I know that are really competent like are not like they, they, they all they all have managed to get into labs um, I think it's just because like that's right. it's not just like the ex equipment's like also the expertise of you know who's doing the experiment um I think there's a couple of things that have been really cool uh counter examples to this like iGEM for example is a program that high school students can join that like you know, sort of allows you to use bio bricks to kind of create your own organisms and like that, that that's a pretty cool program that you could do even outside of a normal lab, um, you can build your own. And then also things like like um, nanopore sequencing where you can buy for a couple thousand dollars a sequencer that you can do and experiment with like in your kitchen. I, I think that's that's really interesting. Like that that kind of like um, power is is just, it's like an iPad or something. It's like, it's extraordinary that people don't talk about it more like the nanopore sequencers aren't more widely kind of like, you know, sort of seen as something that, that's really cool. I think that's partially because like there's not a lot of experience you can do with them, but yeah, the nanopore sequences I think will, will should, should have some impact on like home experimentation. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it possible at this point? Do you think to do the you know I, I think when we think of the, the sort of people Jeremy was talking about, we think of people who are doing groundbreaking work uh, with maybe two or three others in a garage somewhere. Um, you know, is it possible at this point to do interesting work in biology in that sort of environment, or or do you really have to be in a more centralized uh you know research facility or university um it's a good question i, I think i honestly don't know like there, there's a lot of experience i could think of where you you would have to be in like the best lab in the world to even have a chance of, like coming up with like good data for it um right but then i think on the other side there's like a lot of interesting kind of work now where algorithms can just like improve previous kind of like crappy versions of like hardware and so i'm kind of curious if that would lead to an ability to do this more in-house but um yeah, I, I think I'm like not really clear on this. Um, de definitely there's like a whole field of like, can you just use public encode or like GWAS data to do cool studies? And like, I think that's pretty open field. Um, that doesn't require a lab and like the data is like all, mostly out there. Um, so in that case, should by all people interested in biology be taking a more traditional educational path? Should they actually go through the PhD process and try and get, get some kind of uh, lab or research position somewhere? I mean, I, I don't have a PhD, so I, I couldn't tell you the first thing about like what it's like to, to go get one. And uh, people have told me kind of, you know, very varying uh, sort of um, accounts of this, but um, I, I, yeah, I, I honestly don't know. I, I think it would, yeah, I, it, it's hard to like to say, say something really useful there because it, it would really depend on the lab you want to like what you wanted to do. Um, yeah. Uh, Wolf, do you want to take uh, the next question? Sure. I saw yeah, sure. another one. Yeah, so Pasha asks, one challenge in life extension is you don't really know how good the intervention was until people die. 
Um, so what good proxy metrics do we have for, for aging? I mean, this may be another one of these questions where we actually don't know enough, but are there things like grip strength or, or you know, biological markers uh, that, uh, that, that sort of reliably indicate how, how well someone is living? Um, so it's a good question. I, I think you could sort of almost claim that if you care about health span and you're measuring things that essentially are like markers of health span, then that's a, that's a better heuristic for aging than like actual total lifespan. Um, right. And there are a fair number of things that like have, have some degree of correlation. Um, I actually don't know the latest evidence on like what is the best, like if you were to do a composite marker of like all like externally measurable things, like what, what that would predict in terms of like accuracy. I, I'm not really sure, but there's definitely like a set of things that like walking speed or, or even like, um, there's one paper where I think people look like close people's faces and they could predict like who will die first from the code of their face um, that like are surprisingly predictive, at least like according to a few studies. Yeah, I mean, it, this would be a really interesting study to see. I don't know if this has been done, but like you look at the people who are 70 years old and, and you know, you can still feel physically intimidated by them or they still seem really kind of youthful and, and, and uh, healthy. What's different between those people and people who kind of are, let's say, out of their health span? Um, and if that would be a really interesting thing to study. I'd, I'd love to know if, if there's sort of like reliable differences i mean there's probably some i can think of some things that would that are different that i know of but like i'd love to see the full the full stack yeah totally yeah. so um mark had uh, a question about the things you're focusing on so we've talked previously about um some of these genetic pathways through uh worms mice and so on it sounds like you think this is one of the important questions um that's really relevant right now in longevity research uh, Mark is asking, are there any other questions that uh, are are important to you right now or that you think people should be looking at more? Um, I mean, I, I think the biggest question is just like, will it, will it work? Like, are, 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 there th are, there, are there drugs out there that we're taking today that are making us live longer and we don't even know it? Like, that, that's, that's pretty huge. Um, I think actually there's one, it's somewhat related to aging, but it, it's a driver... There's one thing that I'm really fascinated by, which is this idea that like you'll see a very different century of biology than you did previously because of a specific thing that happened like in the 1950s hmm. um, or, or like kind of around then, um, which is basically like the observation that like most of the tools that biologists use to impact biology are physical in nature or they, they used to be physical in nature. So micro microscopy optics, um, a lot of our kind of like MRI or other tools um, sort of using quantum effects or effects but um or, or like you know mass spec like sort of like a combination of newton's laws and electricity um and and that like if you look at the kinds of tools that we now use a lot more of pcr um, nanopore based sequencing um or sequencing in general to do like most things um they're biological in nature like restriction enzymes you know recombinant dna um and if you look at the the tools that we're using to impact human biology they're increasingly complex and biological in nature I think just like no one is really talking about how interesting that is because for the first time the field like a field can feed back on itself and then kind of a flywheel way like you know iterate on and make its own tools mm -hmm. i think that's just enormously exciting and interesting um and i don't know anybody's like studying this seriously but that, that that to me is just like one of the most fascinating things that's happened in biology outside of aging like last you know sort of 100 years and impacts aging because like aging is basically dependent on like our tools for everything for observation and for intervention in humans um, mm -hmm. And so if we, if we just had small molecules forever, we, we could never do kind of like a proper sort of, you know, like sort of aging drug that, that really wouldn't work. Um, and so that's, I think yeah, that's an awesome question. That, that's really interesting. Yeah, like I know physics and engineering and so on were very well served by as they come to understand things better, they can build better tools and, and so on. And so if the same process is happening in biology where the tools are increasingly actually biological, um, and the better we understand biology, the better tools we're able to make. That could be a real accelerator in biotech. Yeah, and I think you're already seeing it. It's just, it's not, it's like so subtle, like, cause it's just the beginning of, the, of, of this thing that people aren't really talking about. And it's not obvious too, because you look at a sequencer, it's like this big, or, or like you look at, um, you know, a PCR machine, it's like this big machine. But like what mm -hmm. is happening inside the machine? It's like a little like nanoscale, like biological entity that is actually doing the process. We should just like a big heater and cooler. Um, Right. Yeah, that's mm. cool. So when it comes to the famous, you know, atoms versus bits question, it sounds like 
you think that biology is actually one of the fields where we might be seeing increasing uh, growth and innovation instead of stagnation? Yeah, for sure. And it, it's, it's not how people think. It's not like you see, well, let's just see more papers, but it's not like that we're, we're, we're coming up with more general principles. I think mean, it's a whole other, like, very fascinating question of, like, general principles of biology. Mm. They're, like, so obsessed with. But, like, the, the question is, um, like, how, yeah, how, how have our tools changed? How will what we see change? It's it just, it's fascinating. You're seeing more and more, like, I recently read, um, again, like, Adam Marblestone's wonderful paper on the principles of neural code recording, which basically tries to analyze from physical principles, like, how it's possible to record signals from the brain. Like he like lists most of the ways to do this and they're all like physical nature, like, you know, put an electrode in, look for sound waves, you know, look for all this, like these other like physical things. Right. And the last one is molecular recording. Like the, the one that he's actually the most excited about from the paper, like the one that like stands out is like, let's just like, you know, encode the signals in DNA somehow and then read the DNA out and like use that as like our medium. And the fact that like, this is now kind of a, one of the more interesting techniques, you know, that, that kind of outshines all these like physical kind of ways to do something is just, it, it's so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, well, this is starting to sound like the early days of, of nanotechnology, right? Like yeah. it's, if you think about biology, fundamentally, it's, it's a nanotechnological system. And people have always yeah. been talking about how we build nanotechnology, whether it's kind of like the Feynman route, where you build smaller and smaller machines that build smaller and smaller machines, or, or like the chemistry route or the biology route. It sounds like the biology route perhaps is uh, starting, to, starting to pick up speed. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like an incredible time to be a biologist right now. <laughs> yeah, it's so like I, I would imagine that in terms of where funding for research comes from, um, medical uh, industry would obviously be a big one. Um, I, I used to kind of focus on on looking at medical devices in some of uh, the, the previous work I did. And it, it seemed like there was a lot of interesting stuff going on there in terms of both biology, also things like material science. Um, are there sources of like funding and research outside of medical biology or is that kind of the main focus uh, right now? Um, I, so there's one interesting phenomenon that I think people also haven't talked about a lot, which is like a, a lot of the, um, there, there are a lot of companies that I'm seeing getting started in bio right now. They're just like people who wanted to do cool science projects and like they couldn't do it in academia. And like for whatever mm. reason, the funding in the past couple of years was so hot. There was like two X the normal number of funding that they could just get like 500K to go run like a high scale science experiment. And like, actually, if I ask a lot of scientists, like why would you ever start a company? Their answer isn't you know, to make a drug or change the world. It's like, I really want to run this cool experiment. And like the only way I can do it at scale with good people and good platforms is like, you know, with that kind of environment, you know, in academia, you can't hire necessarily like the best engineers because you can't necessarily pay them a salary, you have salary caps. Mm -hmm. And also like, it's, it's not kind of like, you know, par for the course, like how someone come in build something and then kind of like not get a PhD, which you might want them to do. Um, it sounds like some kind of institutional inadequacies, like maybe the system is kind of like not very well tuned to what it should be doing right now. I wonder if you would kind of, uh, if you would have an analysis of how the institutions could be set up better to facilitate the kinds of research that actually need to be done or, or that the, the researchers want to do that's sort of the most interesting research. Yeah, I mean, there's like, uh, like Adam Marblestone, again, like, you know, had recently this, this um, sort of tweet post about like how he's starting, you know, an organization to like help organizations like this get started, which, which is really exciting. But, but yeah, I don't have any, like, all I know is that startups are already doing this. Like, they're, they're not like waiting to, to kind of like be told that they can do this. Right. Like, people are companies now to basically run experiments um, that, that if successful will produce like, you know, probably, you know, re reasonable returns, but we're like, they're just interested in it because they want to know the answer. Mm -hmm. um, right. But, but that, I mean, that's somewhat constrained by having to make the case for commercializability. And you could see that kind of either constricting the types of experiments you're able to do, or, or if it doesn't constrict the types of experiments you're able to do, also may not actually deliver the financial returns and then result in some kind of like biology winter from, from investors. <laughs> um, and yeah, I just, I just wonder like, Maybe it's just that the startup environment is better than academia right now, even given those limitations. But I just, it seems obvious that there should be some much better way to do this. Yeah, for sure, mm -hmm. probably. That, that's actually a good um, a setup, I think, to a uh, question. Bonnie has kind of two questions here uh, in this, but I'm going to ask both. Um, first question, uh, what are better ways to finance reversing aging? So, you know, you, you talk about how part of your drive for starting uh, a, a starting working uh, as, as a VC was because you felt you had um, a greater understanding of the field, what was useful to fund. Are there other models of funding um, that interest you or like, 
are there lessons you've learned as a VC about how you should fund these things? Um, I mean, I think probably the biggest update I've had is that, like, I, I, I used to think it was just the money that we were giving and then I was like, like, basically, you can never give somebody enough money. Like, you will always need sure. more money. So it's kind of like finding somebody right. who's confident enough to raise as much money as they need. Because, like, first you're like, okay, we'll give them, like, 500K. I was like, definitely not enough. Okay, $4 million. Like, definitely not enough. So, like, get them to, like, $21 million round. Definitely not enough. So, like, need to come with. So, just, yeah, it's, it's like a lot of, it keeps the person to fish. And then also, my biggest learning is that, like, it's, like, the, the most hard part of this, I think, is that if you want to start a company like this, you have to spend out a year, like, searching in the dark for the right approach and to make sure it's the right approach. And especially if you don't have a co-founder, it can just be psychologically, like, extraordinarily demoralizing, like, because you're just, like, by yourself trying to do this, like, seemingly impossible thing. And, like, that's what I went through when I started my fund is, like, two years of just, like, anguish of, like, this thing is so impossible, but I want to do it, but it's so impossible, but, like, you know, but why? Um, and so, like, I guess the biggest, like, update that I have now is I, when I kind of meet somebody, it's less, like, are you ready to start a company now? It's, like, will you be ready? When's the right time? Like, what would a great year look like for you to get ready to start a company like that? Um, so it's a lot more of, like, a longer term, like, sort of uh, approach to, like, you know, when, when is somebody, like, psychologically ready to start a company and the full conviction in it? Um, and then in terms of, like, funding, um, there's, there's actually one thing that I think nobody's working on right now that really, really should have more thought go towards it, which is, like, why are we so bad at paying for ideas? Like, I'm not saying like, let's lock up ideas forever and like, you know, intellectual property is, is, is the best, but like, I mean, basically scientists who come up with like ideas that VCs commercialize often don't get correctly, you know, rewarded for it. And if so, it's like, okay, we'll give you a third or third or third to like all the interest in the patent, but it's, it's not like a thoughtful, correct like allocation of value created. Um, and I think we solved that problem that would have an enormous impact on every area of science, including aging. Um, so that, yeah. that's, that's one that I think is like just an obvious, like ginormous problem um, that basically nobody that I know is like working on seriously or, or like is competent to like work on. Yeah, I mean, that seems like a really tricky problem. The, the general problem there is sort of like, the, how do you get the value of research to to come back and and fund the research being done in the first place to start with and then, and then you know, ideally reward the researchers? Um, I guess the trick is it's so, the, the results are so diffuse uh, that the transaction costs and actually going and tracking who uh, who's benefiting from the research and like making sure the money gets back there and so on, it actually ends up being really uh, it, it sort of, or you can imagine it that it's actually just inherently prohibitive from a transaction cost kind of perspective, and that you sort of just need uh, large sort of generally interested parties like the government or you know rich philanthropists or something to to fund the things that. Are, are likely to have that kind of impact uh, rather than having the, the kind of like returns uh, thing. I'm, I'm just like, I'm just trying to like articulate what seems to be the difficult aspect there, like why that doesn't seem to be something that we do. And I think it comes down to just yeah. tracking who's using it and the transaction costs are just prohibitive. I mean, just to do a quick plug for feasibility, and sorry, also, I see we're coming up time, like, like, if you look at HSMI, for example, like, you know, the preeminent kind of funder of scientists in the US, they made like a $20 uh -huh. billion dollar endowment, um, they're making maybe like 10%, you know, return on that per year. Um, there was one event where I think Charles Sawyers had a company that returned on the order of something, I, I think it might have been on the order of $20 million, I might be an order of actually off, but sort of like, compared to the amount that the endowment was throwing off per year to fund like everyone's um, sort of fellowships, it was like a substantial fraction, like a 10% of that could have been sort of filled by the profit from like one drug in like even today's poorly allocated system in which HMI kind of like I think has a lot right. of stringent rules and regulations against not having equity in companies that like actually time to start. So it's kind of like it, it's not this impossible view. It's like if you take today's system and you look at like the economic returns to innovation today, like they're not they're like within order of magnitude where you need to be to actually be self-sustaining and, and fund kind of like a lot of very like sort of open field research from the, the like the rewards and benefits of like you know a small fraction of it. Of course, it's like you know one year, and like the other years weren't like that. But I'm just like giving one kind of extreme example because right. it's, it's so like it's, it's very salient that it's actually like in, in a range. Um, so we're not necessarily actually even pressed up against the fundamental limits, but but just like there's a, a few institutional inadequacies that that make it hard to uh, get the returns even from the things that could get the returns uh, quite easily. Yeah, I think anyone who's trying to do this right now is doing it like unthoughtfully. So like you know, let's like you know make companies not want to work with us by like asking for everything like the moon and the sun, right. that doesn't work either. But like, I, yeah, I just, that, that seems like such an obviously interesting problem. Um, yeah. I'm interested in your thoughts on like public insti public health institutions specifically. So I know the FDA had had involvement in like the metformin 
uh, trials um, that I saw come up as you were preparing for this. Um, there's, you know, the, the National Institute, sorry, the National Institutes of Health, for example. Um, are, are there any public health research institutions that you think are interested in longevity or could be made interested in longevity? Or do you think that this is like completely off their radar and really this is going to be a private sector problem? Oh, it's definitely a public sector. I mean, the, the great, the private sector in bio is like basically whatever the public sector says um, is a huge determinant of value. Like, like it, most of the like major value inflection from many companies comes from like a public, like an FDA approval or the results of a trial, which are seen to conform with like FDA expectations or like FDA's like minor opinions on like some advisory board thing that like impacts the company's like the regulatory future. So like, it's, I mean, you can't escape the FDA today. Um, even internationally, you can't escape the FDA. They are a major determinant of like what other countries mm -hmm. do. So right. I think the major battle is, or not battle, it's like the major challenge is to, and the FDA hasn't signed off on anything. They, they, they've just basically said, it's not crazy to go run this aging trial. You know, we're interested in the outcome, but they haven't said that right. they have to as a result of it. Well, so, and I guess that's the question in a way, right? To what degree um, have these agencies been obstacles? Uh, and ha ha are there any cases in which there's been support, I guess, where it's been a positive uh, value adding relationship? Um, I mean, I, I think that it, it's not like the agency is trying to and most of the drugs actually that we have don't work. So it, it, like, I, I sort of don't blame them often for kind of saying that like something is bad. It's, it's more right. like right. to interact with the FDA. If you have to go through a 180 day like view cycle time or like even a 90 or 30 day, every time you want to ask a question about like what you should do to like spend like $30 million on a study, like, like that, that time I, I think is probably the biggest, most, most hard thing. And the like, intermacy of the answer, like you, you don't know what you're going to be told. And it seems to be somewhat sarcastic um, hmm. sometimes. Um, hmm. Yeah. Um, we have a few minutes left. Uh, I'm going to get to part two here of uh, Bonnie's question. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you think the brain is not looked at enough. Uh, how do you recommend studying the brain better? Uh, what, what sorts of questions would people look at? What would that look like if we focus on the brain the way we should? Um, so that's probably an overly general statement in the sense of like, I personally have looked at the brain enough and like I'm in the aging field. So maybe I'm like a you know, somewhat good model for everyone else, but like maybe everyone else has like done a much better job of thinking about this. It's it just like we... I, as far as people know in neuroscience tell me that like we don't know anything about the brain so like it, it's kind of hard to like you know hmm. um we, it, there seems to be right. a lot of um sort of open field there and I think there's a lot of two questions like for example like how do non-dividing cells not age and what can we do to help them age more and there are interesting papers around like for example taking like cells or neurons from different species and transplanting them into other species and saying like do neurons from a shorter shorter lived species live as long as they would have in a longer lived species or can they just keep going and sometimes, sometimes it looks like they can just keep going um, with certain circumstances. And so there's just like all this interesting, you know, sort of um, work. Maybe the, a good place to start would be like thinking about that and also about sort of, you know, transplantation, like some of the ESC experiments and Parkinson's that were done. But I'm also not an expert on like brain specific aging. Um, so just more like I, I, I just don't see enough companies taking unique approaches to that. All the companies I see are like working on Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, um, which just seems less interesting to kind of like a more general kind of less, less disease biased approach. Mm -hmm. um, Cool. So uh, we're about a minute off from the end. Uh, I do want to ask you, though, before we wrap up, your career thus far, you've been focused on the longevity question. Um, it's what you researched, it sounds like, since you were, um, you know, uh, first doing your schooling or your self, your self education. Um, do you think that ultimately you're going to stay in the longevity sphere uh, long run? Or is there some question uh, or some other field that you can see yourself moving to at some point? Um, so I, I think the most fascinating, uh, it's funny you asked, the most fascinating question I've ever heard is from Schrodinger's small book, uh, What is Life? Um, mm. And the interesting thing about the aging field is you can't define death until you define life. Um, mm. And so there's a whole field of theoretical biology out there with a bunch of uh, scattered crazy ideas that I think is maybe the most interesting place ever to, to think about stuff. Um, but it, it's also a field where you can spend your whole career talking with windmills. So if I were to right. ever the aging field, it would be for something like that, but it would be related to aging in that way. Is that a scientific question or a philosophical one or both? It's an extraordinarily scientific question. It, it's, it's like, it's like sort of asking what is motion? And the answer isn't like, this thing like 42 it's like an equation that has some mm. like predictive power for the world 
Um, okay, you're I'm coming up with a scientific design. model. Interesting. Yeah, a scientific model of life itself, basically. Right. And we, yeah. we don't have that right now. <laughs> yeah. All uh, right. Wolf, I'll hand it yeah. to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're out of time. This has been great. Uh, Laura, thanks so much for joining us for a really interesting discussion. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, so as usual, special thanks to all our Palladium members and the audience for the questions. To become a member and get invited to upcoming salons, please visit us at palladiummag.com slash subscribe. Uh, please remember to subscribe to Palladium Magazine on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at Palladium Mag. So thanks everyone, we'll see you next time. Cool. This is a blast guys, thanks again.